Now is, is the time in the evolution of oncology to really focus on that kind of early detection screening opportunity to, to, to get individuals. Let's figure out which modality would be the best way to detect not just one cancer, but multiple cancers, ideally with a single blood draw and ideally with a single modality. Welcome to Target Cancer Podcast. My name is Dr. Sanjay Janeja. I'm a triple specialized uh, medical oncologist and a hematologist, also known as the Onc Doc on social media. And today we are addressing something that I have a litany of questions about on my social media, on messaging, and it's because people want to be, and I think, as you all know, need to be very proactive about their care, right? We have this system that's, that's you know, takes some degree of advocacy. And everybody is very interested in really the emperor of all maladies uh, to steal uh, Sid's phrase and book and Pulitzer Prize that he was on the podcast about a year ago. Um, and to do that, we have someone to help us navigate these waters, the exciting kind of hopefully thing that'll do when it relates to survival and death, because as we talk about all the time, catching something earlier and taking it out sooner is by far the most ideal thing other than, you know, the nuances of a surgeon and the meta you get it out early, it's usually always the best thing to do. And to discuss that and the role for this, um, you know, free circulating tumor DNA testing as a tool to be able to catch up on potentially an early cancer diagnosis, we have Dr. Jeffrey Venstrom, who is the chief medical officer at Grail and extremely uh, not only insightful, but kind of innovative in approaching a otherwise very harrowing diagnosis for which we didn't have a lot of tools. You know, we have even still some pretty archaic uh, imaging modalities and things to do, and, and you really raise the level. So with that said, Jeffrey, thank you so much for being here, and we're so excited. Yeah, likewise, Sanjay. It's an honor and a privilege to be here. Really excited for the conversation. So I can't imagine how often you get stopped or at a dinner table, you know, kind of everyone does that pausing for a second and then wants to just, you know, ask you a dozen questions. Um, what is, I'm just going to start with this. What is your favorite thing in January or now February of 2024? When you were asked about this a thousand times, what is the thing you like to talk about the most when it comes to this whole concept of catching something sooner? Well, how do we get to use it? And what, and what if a doctor doesn't know what to do or what's on the horizon? What is the conversation that's at top of mind when you wake up that, that incites you? Wow. Yeah, there's so much there. And I think I'll start with how you framed it in terms of the relative paucity of tools that we have out there for screening cancer, which is the second leading cause of death worldwide. And we're, we're doing the society, we're doing population, we're doing individuals a disservice by not really kind of focusing a lot of our R&D, our research and development efforts on this pro uh, this problem. I just feel like it's such an, an unmet need um, to change the conversation in the clinic from you know reactive medicine to proactive medicine to kind of borrow another word that you you know started the conversation with um, and really shift the paradigm of how we think about cancer screening and population health by and large. I mean, look, more than 70, 80% of individual of cancers that are diagnosed don't have an available screening modality. We have, you know, five screening tests and they're all, you know, individual cancer screening tests. And we know we have, you know, hundreds of different types of cancers and the majority are not screened for. People are presenting with symptomatic cancer that is widely spread by and large metastatic disease throughout the body. And um, we have a great tools from a therapeutic standpoint and more and more in the diagnostic space to treat these entities. So I feel like now is is the time in the evolution of, of oncology to really focus on that kind of early detection screening opportunity to, to, to get individuals in when they don't have as much end organ damage, when they're not as symptomatic and when their cancers are potentially more, more curative than when they're presenting symptomatically. Yeah. I mean, it's you know, if anyone's listening, just to make you appreciate kind of the reality of several of these cancers that everyone is afraid of just really not having screening, you really have to read between the lines to even kind of get a clue about something being quote unquote, you know, wrong. And and when my residents are rounding, I'll say, 
you know, the reason I'm obsessive is because there's just not much, or at least until, you know, what you all are doing at Grail, to really be able to just overtly say, hey, we think they have a cancer. You look at the alkaline phosphatase or alkphos and you see it, you know, a little higher and you're like, is that potentially bone turnover from involvement or pre-albumin and albumin, which are kind of markers of where is your energy going and is it is it, you know, healthfully getting into your own tissues or is it being kind of robbed elsewhere? It's just, it, but it's all in between the lines reading. And number one, it can cause a lot of, you know, fear and concerns that end up being, oh, the alphabet is up because, you know, something about the liver. Um, and the second part of that is, and this one's challenging, because I think we also do a huge disservice on the psychological and emotional support when it comes to relating to cancer, not just for the patient, but the care providers. Um, that's a big one, right? It's like, the, at the end of the day, they still have to live regardless of what happens with us if we have a cancer diagnosis. They live with that and it shapes their mindset and really the rest of their life in a qualitative manner. And the most common question I get, which presumably is a defense mechanism and an important one, is how did they not see this on a blood test? Or couldn't they have told this on the blood test? When I say any, any other questions, right, about what we're going to do and how to treat, it humbles me when I hear that question because it just tells me, like, we talked about the cancer stats, you know, what we're going to do. And then you hear that as the first question kind of out of the corner of the office. And you're like, this is that unmet need. It's like, how is this missed? And how could this not be reality today? And I always would say, unfortunately not, there isn't, you know, short of, short of a PSA, which even that's, you know, debated and, and stuff. And like, they really, believe it or not, isn't a good way other than leukemia, lymphoma, where something's obvious. And now the answer is different because of Grail and because of this concept of, at least today, it's not necessarily the same as your annual physical labs where you're getting a CBC, right? Anemia can tip off early colon cancers, like I've talked about several times, or kidney cancers or bladder cancers. Should always be your advocate and say, why am I anemic now when I wasn't a year ago, two years ago, five years ago? What happened? If it's from iron, then you worry about blood loss. But short of those, and right now, you know, we're not there. And I'm sure one day we could be, you know, economically, but you made that blood test. How did you all come into that concept? And was it someone that ideally would be an all comer that can get this test kind of an annual way? Or was it more for those kind of more murky waters where you're like, let's help people define something sooner rather than the, you know, health economic cost of scan here, scan there, bring them back. What was the angle? Was it to get through the diagnosis quicker or really ideally have it just as a annual thing one day to where people can catch things almost in a, in a screening for all cancers in one, you know, simple blood test? Well, well. First, let me comment on on your yeah your blood test anchor there, and and I agree. I mean, so much of the population, this is a really common question of why isn't there a blood test for cancer? Why didn't you pick up my cancer? You know, when you were taking all that blood in in the, in the primary care office, for instance. And there are subtle things. I remember in residency being obsessed with the gamma gap, or the you know between the total protein and albumin, thinking oh maybe there's something there too, and kind of chasing down the the diagnostic odyssey there and ALKFOS, anemia, kind of all surrogates, uh, but maybe early early signs. Um, and the beauty of being able to democratize a blood draw um, and, and, and whether or not you think about kind of disrupting the cancer screening paradigm through like an imaging test, right? We know the, the low adherence to low dose CT for smokers and for those eligible, it's it's, it's quite low. And uh, you know, I think one component there, there's, it's, it's multifactorial, of course. There's a lot of psychology in that, um, but just the availability of even a low dose CT for rural populations, having the opportunity to have remote phlebotomy and a blood test, being able to address this problem, I think is is awesome. Is something that really kind of attracted me to uh, to this this technology. Um, and, and to answer your question around, well, both, I think that kind of the origin and then who, who should be, you know, taking this test. One part of the thing that got me to grail and, and, and why I was so fascinated by this organization and, and started following it since its origin in 2016 was the kind of serendipitous clinical observation that, uh, you know, established this organization i um, originally from kind of Illumina where a pathologist, you know, was doing um, non-invasive prenatal testing and identified chromosomal abnormalities that were um, atypical for a fetal abnormality and 
called up and followed uh, you know, a handful. Again, this was anecdotal observation in the clinic, which we all experience uh, as these kind of aha moments, but followed up these, these pregnant women and identified um, cancer that ultimately developed uh, postpartum in these these pregnant women that originated in this uh, this chromos- from this chromosomal abnormality that was an early uh, early sign of that cancer that was asymptomatic that was not overt at the time of the pregnancy and and then the the company was spun out to really focus uh, on. Uh, understanding is this a real thing first, right? Could you actually use, you know, a simple blood test like NIPT for screening for early signs of cancer? And if so, what would be the best modality for detecting that? It, would it be um, DNA? Would it be RNA? Would it be protein? Would it be within the DNA methylation or, you know, epigenetics kind of above the DNA? Um, or mutations um, or chromosomal abnormalities like the original finding and just be v- being very kind of honest and open-minded, I guess, was kind of a key part of this history too. doing bake-off experiments saying, okay, all of those could be possibilities. Let's just test it. Um, let's see what's, you know, A, let's confirm the, the finding and B, let's, let's figure out which modality would be the best way to detect not just one cancer, but multiple cancers, ideally with a single blood draw and ideally with a single modality. So, um, that, that's kind of what got me super fascinated about this, this company and this technology, um, and, and the hope of, of being able to really use a single blood draw and actually detect multiple, multiple types of, of cancer. And then, to your question about who, like, how do you implement this then either in the clinic or for us before it's in the clinic and in, in a clinical development plan too. Um, we have some fantastic epidemiologists at the, at the organization too, that have had like prior careers at the CR registry and have thought deeply about, you know, risks for cancer. And we're thinking a lot about obviously some of the hereditary cancer syndromes and trying to quantify absolute risks for individuals. And at the same time, had this ambition that this should not just be for a select group of people. Um, this should be by and large to try and address that population health need, which is you can't predict what cancer you're going to get. Um, at the end of the day, age it is the dominant risk factor for any cancer. I'm sure there are individual genetic risk factors for, you know, subsets of cancer. Uh, but when you hit the age of 50, which I'm almost there, scarily, um, you're 13 times more likely to, you're 13 times at higher risk for cancer than when you're younger than 50. And, and so that's where we started. We want to be simple. We wanted to simplify kind of that risk question, although I think there's great opportunity to further explore polygenic risk scores and way to interact or interface integrates um, genomic information with family history and clinical information on top of age. Um, but we tried to really start in a very simple, open-minded way that if a busy primary care doc is going to prescribe this test, then let's try and keep it simple. Let's anchor to the dominant risk factor for any cancer, which is age. And let's start doing that experiment and, and, and start you know enrolling a broad spectrum of individuals um, uh, starting at the age of 50 and going above that. Um, to see what we can detect. We part in this interruption real quick. If you're enjoying this podcast or find it valuable for what we discuss and the education and how people see and think about cancer in general, we would very much appreciate a like, subscribe, and especially a share so we can bring that information as maximally and broadly as possible. Thank you so much for listening. You know, at the end, what you were saying is kind of the same way of, of using this concept of if you know that someone has, you know, BRCA, right, a, a germline uh, tendency to have certain cancers or Lynch syndrome. We know that these things cause or prompt kind of more aggressive or more frequent screening measures just because of the statistical likelihood. What you said was very similar. It's like, well, treat age like, you know, in a way like BRCA, Lynch, just where you know the statistical likelihood is increased. Why not use a population for a very you know, consistent and well-described known fat risk factor for cancer, which is that number, that age number. Yeah. So I think that was a way we've never framed it before on this podcast, which is let's just think of that at a certain cutoff point, at least to know where that 13 times multiplier goes up. So that's, 
That's very interesting. And I, I somewhat knew the story about uh, the chromosomal abnormalities in a uh, obstetric setting, but the way you were describing it, it kind of gives this analogy, and correct me if I'm wrong, and I, I mean it sensitively because it's an analogy and it's a serious topic like cancer, but it's as if you are going, say, somewhere where you need quarters and you're going through your coin jar and you're looking at, I got, got to grab all the quarters. Like that's what they were doing to make sure everything was the right, you know, constellation to, to, for the fetus and having the delivery. And as you're going through that coin, those coins, you might find one that's randomly like a euro or a pesos or something that you had from some trip far away. And immediately you're like, wait a second, it's in my coin jar. I own all this, but this does not look familiar to me. And that's kind of the phenomenon that I guess prompted this. It was like, we know what the genetics and everything are for, you know, quote unquote germline, meaning what the inherited genetics are for the mother and for, for uh, the, the fetus. But this does not look right. This doesn't fit either of those. And that's the coin. And then, you know, to take the analogy further, then when you look at the coin, even though it's not, you know, often familiar, you can kind of get an idea of a European coin or whatever. It's like Central American based on the letters and all. And that's what you're doing. That's what Grail is doing. And I hope people can appreciate that same concept is, yes, it is something in your body, but it just looks different. And you can actually characterize based on everything that we know, kind of whereabouts that's from. And that can help you clue into now that quote unquote region in the same way of Central America versus Europe of saying this is kind of the place to maybe do some further investigation. Um, and, and it's very interesting. And I hope people can appreciate the difference of like, why things can look different with that analogy because cancers become cancers generally because they have features that make them, you know, behave differently than your regular selves. And that's what you're identifying. I want this to be clear, and I'm sure you say this until your horse, you're not catching, and I remember this the first time I heard of it a long time ago, you're not catching the cells, right? Because that, that when people hear that, they're like, well, if it's not stage four, you won't catch it. No, what's happening is your heart is pumping blood all the way around the beautiful plumbing analogy I like to use with my patients. It's a closed circuit, it's a closed system. And everything sheds, just like your hair sheds, your skin sheds. Cells have turnover. Sorry to tell you, but that dust is mostly your hair and your skin. When you're pooping, it's colon stuff. And because cells turn over, including cancer cells, and generally they turn over faster. And so in that process, they're just dumping it through your blood. I explained to somebody last week, I was like, ideally the sensitivity or the likelihood of like catching it would be if cost didn't matter and, and nothing else mattered, I would get three samples a day for five days. And now it has gone magnitudes higher because obviously I've just caught more samples of potentially catching that that hair or that dust. Um, and that's why this works. And obviously technology is going as as strongly forward as possible to to have it smaller and smaller amounts, like to where you can really identify this. It's almost like having a piece of that foreign coin and somehow being able to piece it together even without necessarily reading the words. And I'm sure those are things y'all are continuously looking at. I, I'm just curious, as I was telling this to the patient last week, I was like, you know, we don't know if you have more shedding in the morning versus the afternoon versus should it be good to accelerate your heart rate? Are y'all even kind of looking into those things to say, hey, where, what time of day, you know, and what's happening with the cortisol, et cetera, to, to kind of appreciate where you kind of increase the sensitivity of that? Yeah, well, well, two things. First, I love the coin analogy. Thanks for that. Yeah. I'm going to borrow that because I think that's a fantastic analogy. And, and it relates to a really kind of technical component of our test too, that we don't just provide a simple binary result back to the provider, meaning yes, no, there is a signal for cancer. We do provide that information that, and that's super valuable. That's the first layer of information. But that coin, we try and identify, is that, you know, a euro? Is that a pound? Where is that, you know, why is that coin different? And where is that coming from? That we call it the CSO or the cancer signal of origin. And we think that is absolutely a fundamental component of this, this platform and this really new kind of field that, that we're developing because there's a lot of other kind of test developers that, that are trying to kind of crack this nut as well and trying to really bring new innovations into this really exciting multi-cancer early detection field. And we really think that that component of identifying where this potential signal is coming from, whether or not it's the lung or the gut or the head and neck, for instance, is super valuable as that second layer of information to the provider so that 
they don't have to do pan scans and they don't have to go on a broad diagnostic odyssey to try and find where that signal is coming from and then lump it out, do surgery or radiation or try and actually remove the tumor. Um, we actually give that CSO, that cancer signal of origin information back as a second layer of information so that the, the next diagnostic s- stage is more targeted. And we think that's really f- a fundamental piece of, of this field. Um, and, and I also like how you you framed the importance of of shedding, and and I don't feel I mean not there most people don't appreciate that piece of cell turnover. Um, that's a very kind of sophisticated way of describing it too, right? Like every cell turns over, so normal cells, healthy cells, will release um, nucleic acid DNA into the blood, and your blood is uh, filled with nucleic acid from by and large healthy cells, right? And and it's not cells that we're detecting, it's actually nucleic acid from that cell turnover that's happened. In this case, it's from a tumor and this and it actually can be, you know, localized um, that will be shedding DNA into the blood just like any other normal cell. And uh, we're we've developed this technology to be able to filter out essentially the signal from the noise or find that kind of needle in a haystack of by and large normal DNA circulating in the blood and see, hey, that's an abnormal pattern of DNA, um, a, an abnormal fingerprint that's not found in other healthy individuals. Uh, it looks like this pattern is consistent with cancer and um, and it actually looks like it's coming from the lung, for instance. So that's that's exactly how it works, and that's how we kind of frame it. And that that's really important as as an anchor too to understand. Because we're detecting something in the blood, does not mean this is micrometastatic disease, or does not mean that that tumor is actually spread. It's just like any other normal, healthy organ or cell. Um, it has undergone some cell turnover, and thus kind of released. Uh, DNA for in our case into the blood. Yeah, and I think you may have alluded to it earlier. It kind of perked up my ears. But to your point, or as we're describing this shedding that's occurring everywhere, and you're catching the nucleic acid that what you said was mostly good at cells or healthy cells, and then seeing what is obviously different than that, and also recognizing sometimes when it's usually something more sinister. I think you alluded to potentially even pre-cancer or like early you know, shedding. So the same way that you kind of get a colonoscopy and you could have just a quote unquote chill polyp, it's a don't worry about a polyp, or it's a tubulovillus adenoma, which is, we worry about those more. It's not quite cancer, but they are certainly more, you know, steps or bases around the diamond to, you know, to the last step. One can then appreciate or conceive that that same nucleic acid signature may have some of those circulating around. So now all the people that are really concerned about the colonoscopy or someone says, oh, I don't want to do it for this, that, and the other, or they're older. But now if you have this evidence or fingerprint of, for the analogy, a tubular villus adenoma, at the very least, one, yes, an investigation could say, well, what if there's a neighboring cancer, right? Like an actual colon cancer. Because if it's one step away, as it multiplies, it is a new thing. Just like COVID the vaccine, the variants, people can appreciate that it's still COVID, but it's different than the Omicron and this, that, and the other. Cancer is doing the same thing in, in the region. It's starting to have its own variants and its own idiosyncrasies, one part of which would be cancer. But even if you weren't identifying the cancer with that prompt, with that smoke kind of suspecting fire, you still could then take it out because you know these things have a higher chance of cancer anyway. So it's like it's it's a, it's a, a double bang for your buck, if you will. Mm-hmm. And I find that interesting. I keep giving you multiple questions and you're the first guest where you're just like somehow in your head, you just remembered everything I said. So I'm going to do it again just to see if you're doing it. My second comment where I don't want to forget is when you were talking about kind of honing in, I guess with the coin analogy, like what continent. And so instead of we all played, you know, the Carmen San Diego when we were younger and at the beginning, you're just trying to figure out where in the world, right? And then you can start narrowing it down. That's the signature you're providing. I would argue one step further than you on where you say you order the broad scans and then this and that, and yes, that delays time. But as cancer rates are getting younger, and I was speaking on a, on a uh, morning news show about the kind of concern with the ACS statistics and everything on colorectal being the leading cause of death for men that are in their 30s and 40s. So under 50, they don't have a 50 in their name, and it's going to be leading yeah. cause of death. So now, you know, we talked all about it. One of the concerns that I'm sure we'll start talking about is 
knowing that fact, but having a very difficult time even getting the diagnostic, the classic diagnostic or traditional modality. If I mm -hmm. am having a hard time convincing someone to do the CT lung, you know, because they're, well, they're 30, it's too low risk is somebody that tells me that, you know, I'm actually imagining almost a save where if I run into those troubles and I can't get that diagnostic information, now you could, again, obviously, here's a, here's a place to where I could hopefully leverage the findings if it were to be positive to then permit me to get that if you're not already doing that or implementing that. So it could yep. actually be this bridge for a very real problem that we know gets delayed on the approval part of things and the insurance part of things, which is cancer is getting, you know, in younger patients, everyone's worried about it. And yet things are not in place because things move slow when it comes to, you know, guidelines and all this stuff to be able to even work up the thing that we know is happening. And that now Grail can be a very valuable tool as well. Absolutely. Well, so yeah, I think three comments there that I want to comment on. One, going back to your question around shedding biology, really. I think it's actually related to both your comment on pre-neoplastic lesions in addition to the effect of cortisol and whether or not we draw the blood in the morning or the afternoon. I mean, look, I'm the first to acknowledge that. You know, I'm so excited to be in this space because there's still a lot of unknown questions to answer and address and generate data around, right? And that's where we're really trying to like stimulate the American Cancer Society, the National Cancer Institute to really fund more research into basic biology of nucleic acid or protein, you know, whatever, shedding, uh, shedding biology, essentially. And it's funny because just this week, I was having a conversation with our chief scientific officer around designing that experiment, what that looks like to really test uh, the, the timing issue of when we, if we bl draw the blood, you know, at 6 a.m. versus 6 p.m., you know, what kind of experiments do we do? How do we power that experiment to really understand the yield to address some of the kind of false negatives? I mean, look, we know particularly for all cancers, things like thyroid cancer, obviously, some of the CNS tumors, we don't have great sensitivity to, you know, for, and I'll be the first one to, to admit it. And there's like, it's likely multifactorial. Um, there's lots of, lots of things around it. We think a lot of it is kind of being either in sanctuary sites or encapsulated like um, hormone receptor positive breast cancer. We don't necessarily do DCIS. Obviously, we're not actually picking up a lot of those uh, super early kind of encapsulated tumors. Um, at the same time, we're open minded around whether or not just because they had a blood draw at a certain time of day or it, when the yield of that needle amongst that haystack is so low that we missed the circulating tumor DNA that was there that ultimately led to that cancer. So it's in this context of trying to understand the false negatives. What are we missing? And is there a component, kind of a pre-analytic component um, around the blood draw? Uh, so super fascinating. We know also that we don't do great in terms of picking up polyps, right? And in, in, in kind of early preneoplastic lesions. And that's also a question we have. We think we could probably for preneoplastic or at least early um, lesions like MGUS, for instance, um, and NBL, with those that are higher risk or maybe have a higher proliferative rate are more likely to undergo this cell turnover and then release nucleic acids. So we do have some early data that's unpublished and we are really interested in understanding, can we pick up particularly like those high risk early disease lesions or high risk preneoplastic lesions? Um, again, early days, that's kind of that next phase of research is how do we optimize this test uh, that's already working pretty good, you know, with potential for population scale to pick up both kind of early and late stage cancers, but how do we optimize it so we can increase the sensitivity and pick up perhaps even those high risk, you know, early preneoplastic lesions. Um, the diagnostic odyssey comment in question is really interesting too. And it makes me think of uh, uh, one, an experience that we're having in the real world and then a, a bona fide study that we're doing with MD Anderson around CUP of cancer of unknown primary, right? And so there's a lot of interest um, in understanding if our methylation signature that provides that cancer signal of origin or that kind of histology feature could help us um, e either ultimately treat or at least understand the biology and the differentiation of something like a, a, an undifferentiated um, a, a tumor um, and then ultimately you know, help us understand 
both a natural history as well as as treatment options. And so um, in the real world, we're seeing some application of this and we're doing a bona fide study with MD Anderson to really understand among bank samples, at least, um, is there additional information that we can get? Will we get a you know a reliable CSO or cancer signal um, that is um, organ specific or histology specific like neuroendocrine that we can pick up with our uh, methylation signature that can provide more insights to either guide that next diagnostic um, intervention or even potentially therapeutics in the future? Um, and whether or not, kind of to your point about unburden the health system or at least, help us, you know, focus some of our research, uh, or, you know, I mean, our, 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 our looking, our investigation of these, of these patients that either have, you know, unknown, um, uh, or un, un, uncertain symptoms that we don't have a clear diagnosis. That's another kind of product development effort that we're undergoing right now. And that's, we published this paper called this study called simplify study in, in the Lancet last year, where we, um, looked at our technology among uh, individuals that have nonspecific symptoms like weight loss or fatigue or even like abdominal pain um, that you have a suspicion of, of cancer and whether or not either A, we're, we're identifying if there is cancer or not among these symptomatic individuals with, again, still the majority of patients presenting with cancer symptomatically, oftentimes it's with nonspecific symptoms, could our CSO capability our cancer signal of origin capability provide some diagnostic guidance for individuals that are often are head scratchers in the clinic when you don't have really a focalizing sign or symptom. I think there was a, a study in Eastern Asia similar with the with that context that they couldn't figure it out. They knew something was wrong, and they were able to kind of pick up on things, you know, sooner. Granted, this was you know elsewhere, but that's it. It's so helpful, number one. But two, I'm going to do you one step further than what you were saying. You know, one day you'll be able to accomplish, ideally, which is to recognize, you know, different signatures or different, basically, patterns that you can kind of notice is more descriptive of where something came. Because knowing if it was ovarian or, you know, whatever the case may be, perineal, that all matters for one reason, though. It matters because we were using the chemotherapies and treatments based on the site of origin, which we've learned oh, yeah. over you know a couple of decades now. We're, that's why we're so obsessed with well, where is it from because we have fifty year data knowing that with you know ovarian you want platinum and stuff. So all a lot of that stuff you know sits in place for sure. But what a lot of people say, which I think where you know something like Grail can be so helpful, is they say in an ideal world where it came from doesn't and shouldn't matter because it only matters because we studied things so obtusely in a kind of constellation of buckets. And yet we've recognized so many features that make these signatures you're talking about that make them resistant to a therapy or sensitive to a therapy or hijack the immune system to where in an ideal world, we don't care where it came from. We care about what is the entire constellation of properties so we can best and most precisely attack that specific signature for, for for that person like talk about signature as in like penmanship that or pen womanship either one is that's the ultimate play or hope and in a weird way and again i don't mean to use analogies that that undermine the gravity of it but in a weird way it's like saying and this makes me sound high maintenance and i'm not because i never really get to eat anyway when you go somewhere <laughs> and they're like would you like the fish the meat or the veggie dish and i'm like really like that's that's it those are your choices and like and and they seem sometimes peeved if you ask, well, meat for bear, like, what is the meat, right? But that, in a weird way, that's how chemotherapy and origin is. It's like, is it, is it meat, is it fish, is it whatever? Because we know generally that these are the tendencies. What having these patterns and a full like idea that Neil is saying, oh, it's like has lemon sauce and it, it's medium rare and it's salmon and it also has some capers. Now you have a whole different like appreciation of what will or won't be pleasant, how to attack it, how to approach it. That is the ideal way we treat cancer one day, which is like to have that yeah. constellation far more. And yeah. that's the beauty of when you say data and analyze and all of these things, yeah. that's what you mean is to be able to not only kind of link it up to the practice of the things we've been doing for decades, but even potentially prospectively know what works well and what doesn't. And that's what's exciting. And anyone listening or has listened to previously, my answer that I am, I want to say, I hope you know the answer 
that will help is AI, right? So that's where AI now, artificial intelligence, can these same observations you're working so hard to make. People think of AI as just a binary thing. It's like it's good or it's bad. I'm like, no, I just need something that analyzes in patterns that I can't even start to conceive. I can yeah. I can say maybe 6 a.m. and 6 p.m. matter differently because of dilation mechanisms that happen in your blood vessels that we all know when it comes to the cortisol and when you're awake, all that stuff physiologically and theoretically is relevant. But I would love to have 10,000 minds just look for any other pattern of any kind of, you know. And so I think the integration of that, which I'm sure you have, that's one of the half a dozen points I'm forcing you to have to remember uh, to help with that. And the second and second and second B point is to, when you were talking about the proliferation rate, that's such an important concept that I hope people appreciate is things that replicate fast also die fast, right? That's the whole purpose of replication. That means that they, you know, how blood vessels, you know, red blood cell last, you know, 120 days or so. Playlists don't last as long. So all of these things um, are matter on shelf life. And so, yes, things that are slower, generally your positive tumors and DCIS and these polyps, if they're not turning over frequently, they're not dying frequently. And in a weird way, that's when we say this is a non-aggressive tumor. A lot of times non-aggressive tumors are hard to cure because we kind of focus on the fact that they replicate fast. And a lot of chemo is on the replication cycle. So like follicular lymphoma, for example, slow. Yep. It's also really hard to treat. And I bet it's hard to find on a grail test because it's all for the same reason, which is well, that, that that nucleic acid or, or shedding uh, that's occurring. But it's also why there's a lot of interest. We had Scott Penberthy, the, um, he's a good friend of mine now, um, director of Google AI. And he was saying, well, Sanjay, you know, there's going to be a day where we have these implantable devices. And now, just like Grail, which has just done amazing things like for how we see things sooner, imagine if you were just assessing your metabolic activity in these little migrations from the quote unquote epitome of the healthy cell or profile, cell or profile to now you integrate AI to analyze all of it to say, forget first, second, and third base. We knew you were 10 inches towards first base, and we know how this rodeo goes because of our assessments. That is it in the most ideal world, how cancer will be, quote unquote, it cured. I always have a problem that says, right. one day we're going to cure cancer, right? I'm like, I don't know that, or a cure. I don't know that we'll have a cure for all the cancers, but if cancer will be cured, one, it's going to be a bunch of different treatments, but two, it's going to be, Cancer is cured because it's eradicated. Because if yeah. you're able to actually, usually you have lead time on almost every cancer, except for maybe off the top of my head, leukemia, acute leukemia. That seems like a switch flip. There's not like a, you're headed towards leukemia. It just kind of happens, acute leukemia. But most things, and we've had podcasts on that metabolic activity and mitochondrial injury. If you could start identifying those, like say you and I are talking 20 years and more gray, and we can say, hey, remember those times we were looking for the actual features of the cancer? You know, that's how we did it in the 20s, like 20, 2020s. And now we know better. We know that these are the things that lead to that. That's how you beat cancer ultimately. And, and, and yeah. that's the kind of direction for frame of mind for someone to list, listening on what we, why we are hopeful with the things you all are doing in other places. Well, yeah, no, I, I, well, I love the the future questions and let, let, let's get into kind of that, that what does the future look like conversation? I love it. And it, it's a good call out around our current, nomenclature capabilities right so we've developed we've translated hyper and hypo methylated regions of the genome that we capture in our test into the context of the current vernacular Love. which is non-small cell lung cancer neuroendocrine tumors which are how our guidelines in oncology nccn guidelines are still by and large identified by organ site or disease specific histology and so the information that we extract from the genome we try and put into simple context and language for what we're doing today in in oncology and i i share your kind of sadness that this is still where we're at you know in 2024 that we know that there's so much other, perhaps more valuable and targetable information behind that label of lung cancer or gastric cancer or ovarian cancer um, that this is to me and to you what you're describing so old school. That's how you know oncology was you know founded and and developed, and yet we're finally slowly but way too slowly, uh, I think for, from our perspective. 
um, uh, chipping away at more kind of tumor agnostic drug approvals. So look, during my drug development career, I was part of kind of the the checkpoint blockade, PD-1, PD-L1, you know, revolution and helped launch atezolizumab and, and did some biomarker research around how do you identify individuals that are responsive. And now we have, you know, a pan tumor approval for, you know, checkpoint blockade that really will address that biologic question, like, is this tumor susceptible and does it show signs like microsatellite instability um, uh, for sensitivity to these different drugs? And I am optimistic related to that future state of having more tools on the shelf therapeutically that can perturb the epigenetics of tumors too, right? Like, I think, sure, we have some dirty hypomethylating agents that are in the clinic that are FDA approved that are valuable for a tiny portion of cancer patient, but there's so much power and control of tumor behavior in our genes and the epigenome. Um, unlocking how to drug that has been a challenge for drug development for years with early, small, less targeted successes. But I really am optimistic that part of also that next uh, phase of of drug development will uh, partly be informed around what we're learning around uh, cancer screening and the epigenetics of tumors, um, but also help us really unlock and then change the way we 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 report out our information, right? Like I would love we could do that today. We could report out in this G region or around these CPG sites, uh, understanding that we profile more than a million CPG sites, like we truly have a, a big data opportunity with, uh, you know, from that single blood draw that we get from an individual because of the breadth of our, of our sequencing, we could report out the granular details around these regions are hyper or hypomethylated. And wouldn't it be cool to have agents that you could actually target? Um, and we wouldn't necessarily have to call out this is coming from the lung or from the over. We could call out that this is an abnormal and aberrant methylation pattern. Um, that you know, with this region being affected, and you now have this drug, uh, you know, addressing that either low low methylation state or high methylation state, and that's the best way to to treat that individual. Again, we're not there yet. We're far from that, unfortunately. Um, I think that's how we can evolve not only this technology, but also kind of our ability to in inform practice and report out our, um, you know, our, our results. Yeah. I mean, you know, to use a clinical example, it's, it's how when I am giving lectures and I'm talking about platinum therapies, I was kind of asterisk oxaliplatin, right? Cause I'm like carboplatin and cisplatin generally interchangeable, but oxaliplatin, if anyone's listening and knows someone like full Fox, full theory that, oh, in in GI tumors is is just we don't use it at long, right? And it's it's there's a reason for that. And I'm sure there's a methylation right. identity for that. So where right now we identify it as okay, you know, Sally use your reserve just for the you know whole record GI stuff. Instead, there is a coding for that instead of speaking the that's language of, hey, where are you from? Where do you live? And if I were to say North America, like that's the language we speak, right? It's like, okay, are you Canadian or are you United States? And you may be able to like break it down more, but our guidelines, if anyone listening, is based on that and not me saying I'm from Baton Rouge, New Orleans, Louisiana, right? So like it becomes, that's the reason if people have frustrations about saying it has a 40% chance of working, 60% chance of working, 50, 30% of recurrence. Those are abysmal for 2024 to say, how do you not know more, bro? Like which... Which category am I? Am I the 60 or 40? I don't know. Like, there has to be more. But if you're speaking, is the food going to be spicy tonight when I go over to your grandma's house and you say you're North American? It depends if you're in New Orleans or if, you, if you're in you know, Canada or the Midwest, right? My, my, my wife grew yeah. up on potatoes and, and that's why they moved here <laughs> because her and her twin sister, they love the spiciness. And I'm, and again, I don't mean to, to, to say that to, make, to be insensitive about the gravity of the, of the conversation, but only to kind of highlight in some way the ridiculousness of how we're also still kind of having these nomenclatures and therefore not able to give more accurate expectations when truthfully the science has really probably has a lot of the answers in there like you just need to look at it you just see who's sensitive to certain drugs the metabolism do they need extra amounts of that drug to even have the efficacious dose because right now it doesn't matter really if you're brown or you know black white it's more your weight based but we know 
that there are idiosyncrasies about how what we do with that drug that we're getting. So there's so many factors yep. that go into these very loose, terribly, I think, unfair and unjust to the patient statistics. But that's what you're doing on the background. That's what I want people to know. It's like, even though like you have to speak the language for clinical practice, because I'm not going to know what those things mean. But when a software can yeah. translate that in clinical you know, understanding, this is the step where we learn to be able to get there. And that way I can say you have about an 88 to 92% chance. And here's why. You don't have X, Y, Z, and, and F that are the reasons that generally are, are resistant to carboplatin. And you know you have MSI high where I know you're mean therapy, so we're embedding that. And so now you're getting this cocktail of basically both, not just targets, but things that may equip the cancer to resist something rather than this obtuse, hey, North Americans are kind of jerks and Europeans are nice. Like, you know, like any kind of bias is unfair. And in, in a weird <laughs> way, we're doing that even though we don't have to, it just takes... I make it sound easy and you're probably like, Sunday, it's not that easy, but it just takes assessing all the stuff that we do know and actually making sense of it, which again, in my Absolutely. personal opinion is where artificial intelligence comes in and starts to make sense Absolutely. of this stuff that a human mind would take logarithmically longer to do. Absolutely. Yeah. No, I mean, and the promise of computational biology and machine learning, I think is absolutely huge. I share your your optimism. I was actually just on a, a panel at Stanford last week with, with Scott around the future of, of AI. Um, and we maybe had some difference, differings of opinion as it re relates to where the guardrails should be put for you know implementation in the clinic at least, um, but totally shared the, you know the optimism. And I really think you know in, in the diagnostic space at least this is the, this is where we are making now in 2024 inroads in that promise, right? Like this technology having a a shared cancer signal, which is what the, the gallery grail test is based on, that can capture more than 50 types of, of cancer it would not be possible without sophisticated machine learning algorithms that can make sense, not only identify or understand patterns that are shared across more than 50 types of, of tumors, but that also make sense of that in a simplified way that report out that cancer signal of origin and report out a, a binary yes, no. I mean, that requires a machine that requires, you know, huge computation when you're trying to crunch, you know, a million different regions of the genome um, for one simple yes, no answer. Um, and sure, there are elements of biology, right? They're actually really interesting components of the hallmarks of cancer, like apoptotic genes that were able to understand their methylation state um, that is included in you know, our, our, our ultimate kind of platform, uh, but this would not be feasible in 2024 without the advances of, of machine learning. And then to that vision of having a sensor where you're capturing kind of the proteome, the epigen, the methylome, the, the, the genome information, in addition to any other circulating soluble factors on like an hourly basis, we'll need a machine. We're not there yet. We'll need a machine to integrate all that information understand what it's telling us and then give signals about how to perturb those surrogate markers for for health and physiology yeah it's like it's 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 signals that maybe you know distress in some and not others it's it's, it's just so fascinating but the more longitudinal you are with your assessments of what is a baseline use machine learning to know this is within the realm of normal for you like I was talking to a patient earlier, I was like, the reason that our B12 range is ridiculous, like, is because it's like 190 to 930. And somebody might say, why is that range so broad, right? And the patient is yeah. like fatigued and all this stuff. And I was like, and low macrocytic, I'm like, even though you're technically normal on the range, I want you to try it because that range is very broad for, because it, it doesn't yeah. pertain to you, like the precision therapy. Yes. And, and, and that's where these kind of things can be, when analyzed and crunch, um, just so, so helpful. One important thing though, to, to mention, as, as you're saying too, the more analysis you have, the more you're able to kind of longitudinally compare to previous things. And when you're talking about sensitivity, all that to say, the important point is, and I get this question a lot, is just because your test is negative doesn't mean like, I'll get this question, hey, I got a grail, or actually my the messages I get are, I think I'm just going to get a grail so I don't have to worry about it anymore. And <laughs> exactly. like, And, and that, that's, that is not the instance for anything. But the way I describe it is, it's a picture. You're taking one picture at one moment, the same way that my CVC is going to be different today, tomorrow, whatever, because they'll be really stressed. I'm like, why was that white count high that time? I'm like, if I run 
10 flights of stairs, my white house is going to go up. There's all kinds of dynamic variability that anything yeah. that is a one time is a picture. Yeah. And right. it was a conversation I was having, you know, with, with someone recently, we found a, a, a duodenal cancer. So in the small bowel and there was a little annoyance towards me for referring to GI because they had a scope about nine months ago and it was clean, right? Like meaning they looked in the small intestine, and there was nothing, but there was a new iron deficiency pretty advanced. I said, it's the appropriate thing. And turns out there is a mass. That is an example of where that scope was done nine months ago for whatever reason. And same way if you had the grail nine months ago and the question was, you know, well, then how did it get this big? I'm like, well, that means it replicates fast to feature, right? Which I would assume. And again, it's an assumption you'd catch things that replicate fast more on grail. But I told him the flip side is it probably melts away fast in general things that replicate fast, you know, so I had to explain to them though, that it was negative because it wasn't there. It's there nine no, no, months later. And then we're, you know, at the cost of losing popularity for pushing for, for a scope. But this is why. Same concept. I'm saying it very circuitously. It tells you you're good at that moment, probably at that, right? The sensitivity can always be improved. It's a good reassurance. It catches something if it is is there to a certain sensitivity and it tells you if there is something to investigate sooner, which will hopefully make the challenge much more doable if it's all regional, not even local regional, but just regional. It hasn't even gotten on the interstate. So it has the benefits of all those things, but by no means should be a, uh, I don't need any more screening again, cancel all the mammograms. Like, you know, that's not the same thing that I hope someone can appreciate now after listening to all this. Such an important point, Sanjay. Thank you for bringing that up. That, that, yeah, that it, getting a, a grail test is a snapshot in time, is, you know, one experience during that hour, during that day. And, and one of, uh, you know, my biggest fears is that people are going to overinterpret what that negative result means. And that's by and large, you know, based on your age and lots of, you know, variables that go into it. But by and large, the likelihood of getting a grail test, if you're at average risk or slightly higher average risk than average risk, um, is going to be negative. And we really want to, Try, like, uh, you know, all of the medical affairs organization, all of our educational material is this is not a replacement for a standard of care screening test. This is not a replacement for colonoscopy. The grail test is not a replacement for mammograms. It's complementary. It's an adjunct. Yeah, it's coming. Added, one of the added values is the total adjunct to all the other standard of care screening tests. The huge one of the huge added values is we can detect for those cancers that currently we have no available screening tests that often are highly lethal, as your point, and highly aggressive, like pancreatic, like liver and gallbladder. And we actually have proven data to show we can detect those cancers that currently we are doing nothing about in the clinic. And those are not colon cancer. We have great tools for colon cancer. We're not going to replace colon cancer screening that's currently done today in clinic. And this is completely complementary and should not be seen as a replacement for standard of care screening modalities. Yeah. And it tells you nothing about the future. I need to make that clear too. It doesn't tell you what your deck of right. cards is three months ago from now or six months ago. Right. I mean, sorry, three months from now or six months from now. It tells you nothing. It only tells you right. at that moment, based on everything in history right. and today, um, is the assessment you're performing. And I like the way you put it. It doesn't replace by any means the core pillars for which we have things that we're afraid of and do a good job of, of, of finding, you know, five-year survival of breast cancer now with everything combined, including these S is like 91, 92%. So that, those are the things that they're screening for to be able to catch early and hopefully get a hold on. But again, I need to say this because you said it beautifully. Many of the cancers we fear, cholangio, the pancreatic, there just isn't screening. And then on top of that, we, we're going to identify more and more of these risk factors of diabetes and central obesity, not just obesity in general, all these nuances that hopefully, you know, tech crunching will help with. And then also to not have a way to check for those instances where we know you have a statistical elevated risk. Like I said previously, the BRCA, the Lynch, the age, you reach a threshold to where you can say the likelihood is enough to where it's worth spending X to prevent Y. The quality of life right. cost, if you're somebody that just has to talk the numbers because that's how the healthcare system talks, unfortunately, but it is what it is. Also, to even justify the cost to the insurance company, whatever, it may, they may say your risk is high enough in these, you know, in this constellation of risk factors. I would rather get you a grail now than have to pay for the cost of chemo because now you've reached this threshold based on your age or that you have hepatitis and you're worried about the, you know, liver cancer. And we know that an ultrasound is at the mercy of a tech 
and the visualization and the radiologist and how much coffee they had that day. It's like the more you think about it, it's like the amount of variability we just permit <laughs> as, as science in 24, well, it sometimes is very uh, alarming. But but this is where is. this kind of stuff really you know makes me very hopeful and, and democratizes. Yeah. So you're not at the mercy of the yeah. tech that unfairly has to see double volume in a day and their eyes are lacking. Like, but that's the sad reality now. But this is the way we can actually help standardize the reassurance yeah. of an evaluation. Yeah, yeah, sure. No, I mean, just because on that point, I really wanted to highlight too how serious we take kind of our responsibility to population health. Yeah. And one of the major differences with this test is it's tuned for high specificity. And, and I don't want to get too technical, but what a lot of our standard of care screening tests is why you're saying like partly why I think, you know, breast cancer survival, which you quoted is so great these days is A, we have a screening modality, B, we have fantastic drugs and C, I mean, we, we're, we're, we're catching things early. Um, one of the key differences from like mammogram, for instance, mammogram has a, a positive predictive value of less than 10% or around 10%. And that means that, and a lot of women have experienced this, you're going to, li you're likely going to get a false positive and have to get either an ultrasound or a biopsy or some other invasive or lumpectomy. procedure. Like, plenty of times. That old. Yeah. And a lumpectomy because of a false positive. Uh, whereas when we develop this and as we're thinking about trying to detect multiple cancers and go population wide, we wanted to make sure again that we are not sending out a lot of incidentalomas and a lot of false positives. And so, you know, our positive predictive value around 44, 45% um, is, you know, a, a magnitude higher than our existing standard of care screening. So again, an adjuvant, adjunct, adjunct to complementary piece of cancer screening, not a replacement for mammogram with very different features, right? That's why mammograms will likely pick up those encapsulated hormone receptor positive breast cancers that we know we will not detect because of the tuning of our algorithm, the tuning of our test for very high specificity and likely because of some of the, the biology of shedding tumors uh, that mammograms will detect. So again, I still think, again, I, I think the future is that combinatorial approach of multiomics with imaging and, 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 and fundamentally blood-based uh, screening modalities. How good does that feel to be able to say, you know, mammograms, which is a household name, everyone knows 10% and you're like, that's why ours is 40 to 45 percent productive. I mean, you did, you accomplished that in a couple of years, but that's, you know, that's a testament and, and something very important. You know, we had Jason Fung, the author of the, the obesity code, the cancer code, that he's called, and he feels very strongly and he's a nephrologist. He does, he does, you know, disclaim that, but just, he's like, if you just look at the numbers of economically and cost wise, everything that comes out of all of these false positives from a mammogram, you know, there's not a small subset that really raises the question of how helpful are they? Are they? And okay. my answer is usually, again, yeah, they, they have a more sensitivity, sensitive approach uh, to be able to catch something like a DCIS, but they're going to catch a whole bunch of things that aren't, right? And that's right, the cost right. Of, of one or the other. But this is where hopefully like just like you said complimentary in a complimentary fashion or maybe one day replace if you're having that much of false positives and the economic cost and the disfigurement and, and again all these things you can imagine yeah. the more sensitive the more we understand and learn how to get the best yield the specificity you're so superior right that's that's the whole purpose we don't want to cause th that is the most conservative way to do right by the person because you're doing more right compared to nothing else, to no other options. Right. Like it's, it's something, yeah. but it's not going to be alarm for the masses. And that was important right. to you because it's something, it's the best of zero options and, and pretty darn good for that reason. But in an ideal world, you'd be able to do it even more often and more sensitive. And that's, you know, yeah. that's, that's, right. that's the ultimate hope, like you said, of putting it all together and really being able to map it and, and do all those things. Jeffrey, you're very, yeah, new. well, let's try we'll get to too like the, the we what keeps me up at night is screening interval like how often should this test be taken and we're studying annually right we think that's scalable that's something that's probably most relevant for most people uh, one kind of study design that we have on the shelf that i'm really interested like among lung cancer i mean lung cancer survivors by and large or lung cancer survivors specifically we have actually a, a study written for this maybe they should be taking it every six months particularly like heavy smoker lung cancers um, that have been resected, that potentially cure. They're up risk for other either smoking related or just your common cancers as they age. 
Um, and maybe that should be, you know, given every six months. And then maybe people that are have lower risk should be given every other year, like that screening interval, because that that's where we need to get to, too, beyond this snapshot in time to really understand kind of that longitudinal assessment of your methylation signature in, in this case um, and, and how that can potentially inform either ultimately your, your risk at the end of the day or just be able to pick up, you know, those particularly aggressive cancers that might be progressing pretty rapidly. Yeah, it's like a it's almost like a dial that you're dialing up or dialing down based yeah. on how loud somebody's speaking. If they're on the mic down, same thing. It's like if you have more risk, you need a proportionally more frequent or conservative approach versus less. And those lengths will be right. made. I mean, same way with like, you know, bladder in situ cancer. Right. So like my yeah. patients fear sometimes having to get another, you know, exploration cystoscopy, get it, you know, taken out yeah. go through the cycles of, of putting stuff in the bladder and they can hurt. And so instead of having kind of arbitrarily these, you know, examinations in there, identifying those populations where something's gone awry, the village has all been exposed to the same thing. And so, you know, that's the whole concept of second primaries where you know that yes. the kind of architecture or environment or garden of the colon has been awry in some areas. Yeah. And therefore, statistically, right. it's far more likely in that individual that those same, you know, getting base first base, second base, third base, when we were talking about going the steps you need to get get to cancer. Same with pap smears. This is all a concept that I hope people can appreciate listening to this. It's 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 the exposure and the lead time towards getting to that cancer. And those are the pe- populations that do have a higher risk. But really, there's not mm-hmm. a lot of nice dialing up and dialing down in those subsets with screening today. Like that's, that's unless yeah, you have Lynch or something full blown, we're leaving mm-hmm. all the rest of it on the table. Like as far as like mm-hmm. really, you know, you know, not secretly, really knowing that these things can happen. And this is where Braille and these other molecular modalities that are non-invasive that have high specificity can hopefully do justice by them. Because let's be honest, they're limited because the cost would be too much to to have to elevate for everyone. And so the people that actually right. require more end up being the ones that quote unquote lose. And that's just feels, it just right. doesn't feel good. That feels, you know, quite unright. Right. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, no, I was just talking to a patient that we diagnosed with um, Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia, too, to your point about like we, we we keep learning about how our methylation signature just can be detecting all of these even relatively rare tumors. What I think there's like six in a million per year of, of Waldenstrom's. And um, and obviously you would never, te- you know, you never create a screening test for that type of rare lymphoplasmacytic disorder and uh, the, 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 the scalability, the, the, the power of, you know, one simple methylation signature to detect multiple rare cancers. Um, it's just, it's transformative for, I think society ultimately, definitely for the practice of medicine, um, because it's not tenable. It's not tenable to create, you know, dozens of individual screening tests for all these rare cancers that we have, that we know have different biology that we know are treated ultimately differently. Um, but it's just not, not, not scalable and not, and not uh, you're not able to do that and minimize false positives, for instance, at the same time. Yep. Well, Jeffrey, it's extremely humbling and inspiring to listen to you. I think your passion is it's just so easy to appreciate and uh, just comforting as 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 a non doctor for a second and just as a patient, just knowing that people like you um, and what you all are doing are just quote unquote taking care of us the best way possible. You know, as we get older, our kids get older, our loved ones, um, and that's the purpose of this podcast is to try to hopefully, if not reinsure, at least provide optimism for these are the steps that are being taken. And this is why we say that it hopefully won't be the same as it is today, five years from now and 10 years out. These concepts, not talking, I live in North America, but saying I live in Baton Rouge, like, and how that concept, you know, uh, is relevant to then, you know, the stories you hear that are tragic from, you know, we're told that the average response rate was xyz but my mother my father my child you know had a very different outcome these are the kind of things that can hopefully explain that because in addition to diagnosing it's also the pattern recognition and understanding of these features that can ultimately do right by those people that that do have one taken under them because we just don't have a better data calculation to date totally yeah well and sanjay thank you for what you do too i mean you're really raising awareness you're educating your audience around these new technologies and new tools right i mean this is 
Grail Gallery is not a household name. There, there are too many people that kind of don't know about where the science is evolving and what it's now available for cancer screening. And it's guys like you that really take the time out of your super <laughs> busy clinics and days to, uh, you know, carry out your passion and really identify, you know, where there's new technology that that your listeners should be aware wow. of. Uh, so, of thank- course, I appreciate that a lot. I think I think we've lost trust somewhat justifiably the healthcare system in general and especially with yeah. COVID has been catalyzed and I think it's because we've always had this hush hush do what I say mentality not we as in us you and me but but you know before us and now people just deserve better they deserve to be involved to understand and to totally. just under, yeah. you know, appreciate why it makes something that seems like a miss or a failure that will be heavy on your heart forever makes it so much less debilitating when you can appreciate both the challenges but also the the potential pluses of things. So I can't wait to hear what's next. Yeah. Well, and empower your, your, your patients, right. And individuals too. that shared decision. making. I mean, you and I were trained in the era of shared decision making, yep. right. I mean, we're not in a, a field of patriarchal, dogma, right. Yeah. Hierarchical patriarchal medicine. It's, it's shared decision making these days. And so I think again, through your service, through what you're doing on your podcast too, you're really enabling that future state, I don't think it's enough of a reality now, unfortunately. I think there's still too many folks. Well, to your point about the, the trust, some people still really mistrust, you know, this, our healthcare system. And some people still want kind of the doctor to step in and just make that decision without getting informed. But, but my, by and large, I think, you know, the, the, we are getting to a state where the expectation and the reality is, which I think is good, is, is shared decision making. And and your podcast, your efforts, your educational activities really contribute to that state. Thank you. That's a, very humbling to hear from someone I admire and respect very much. So hopefully we'll have you back and be able to really discuss what's developed. I love that. Yeah. Thank you, Sanjay.